Um, Matt's going to talk about digitizing field books, and so I'm going to show you kind of how we've been doing that with our field notes. Um, but really, the talk's more about why we should do this or why I actually do it, um, and, and more about contextualizing what, what, um, what are some of the applications of, okay, you scan all these you know, notes of dead people or living people or whatever, what can they actually tell you? Um, and part of this, for me, um, relates to uh, using kind of a, a collecting event-based approach to databases as opposed to a specimen. Uh, based approach. <coughs> so what do I mean by that? Uh, well, what is the collecting event? Um, but when I say collecting event, I'm really meaning a unique grouping of data. I guess it's the vial of specimens that all share the same data. They might be different taxa, but they're from the same place, in the same time. They share all the same ecological data. It's kind of like the kernel of information in the database uh, that is shared among objects, but it's still fairly unique. Um, so for example, like if this new about I'm collecting a lot of insects, and all of you know, there might be a thousand specimens here, but um, we might mount them all separately. They might go all on all their different ways, but really they relate back to the same unique um, collecting event, same amount, same identical um, parts of information. So um, when we, uh, you know, most of us, I think, when we go into field collect, uh, collect specimens, we have field numbers. So like this little set of off, but um, my field number down here at the bottom, which we use the code using the, the uh, country and the date and the what and the Cali, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and when you think about databasing specimens, not drawing back from collecting events, when you think about a specimen based approach where you really are, um, you have your specimens, you're entering specimens into the database, and you're attaching the data to those specimens. Or you can think about it as an event based approach where you have data in the database, and then you are attaching specimens to that data. And in some ways, it's, it's just two sides of the same coin. They're not exclusive to things, uh, but they do allow different properties later. Um, so for a couple examples, um, we were collecting in Venezuela, in Paramo, we were collecting out of there. Um, if I attempted to collect insects, I might have collected water quality data, I have a habitat picture, I have field notes, um, but we, we didn't get anything in the pool. So from a specimen-based approach, I never collected here. There's no data in the database to go into it because there are no specimens to put in the database. That data has no way of being shared. Whereas if you just took a, a collecting event approach, you would enter this data regardless of if you got specimens or not, so it still lives in the database. <coughs> Another approach. So this is a distribution of this, of this water beetle species in Venezuela. You can see that there's a few points in the northwest in Falcon. Um, and you know, for a lot of tropical insects, you have really no way of knowing, like, is this an artifact of collector bias that no one, you know, one person took a nice, you know, they were up in the air and they were snorkeling and then they went over and then collected a little bit, or is that actually real? So if you plot that against um, all known collecting events um, for uh, Atlantic species, you can see in fact there's quite a lot of collecting that's been done, and in fact that probably represents a real limited distribution. So again, we're trying to tease apart absence data here um, using collecting events as opposed to specimens. <coughs> so, how does this actually translate into workflows and, and why is it more efficient that way from like a scientific standpoint. And the example I'm going to kind of uh, show, um, uh, the aquatic beetle collection of the is about 1.5 million specimens, the largest in the world, um, and it's very intimidating. So if you were to start from a uh, specimen-based approach to even tackle this problem, it is massive. Um, and so instead, we did a different, there, there was a unique set of circumstances here that allowed us to try something different, and that is most of these specimens, probably about uh, more than half of that 1.5 million were generated by one or a handful of um, collectors over the last 60 years. So I was able to get a hold of their entire careers worth of field notes from 1951 to 1995. And uh, we said, okay, well, sitting on my, in my office here, I basically have the data for half the objects in this collection. Isn't it easier to digitize this on my desk? Isn't that more efficient than going to the collection specimen by specimen and trying to tease apart stuff? Yes, I'm not going to get everything at once, but maybe this will speed the process up. So this is this is why we did this. Um, and it, these are the kind of I mean, we're just scanning pieces of paper here. It's not that complicated, but uh, basically the first step was scanning the notes. We have a flatbed scanner and a, and a uh, sheet scanner, which are amazing. If you don't have one, I urge you to get one immediately. Um, well, these are loose leaves, so I should have you know seconds to actually scan the, scan the packets of notes. Uh, and then the time consuming part that happens with the annotations and whatnot. So uh, the second step we do is we assign every um, collecting event that we can determine a unique collecting event code. And it, we stamp it, we brand it on the top of the PDF. So you can see we stamp this one up there, PJS DP86 And this basically is um, not random. It's based on the collector, the country, the date, so 1986, February 24th. And then we have to arbitrarily assign a number just to, so this is 
might have collected in you know six places on one day. And since we usually have the whole packet of notes, we just chronologically assign them one, two, three, four, five, six. So that note gets forever branded with that collecting event number. Assuming there's not always so simple. This was a journal from Africa, and of course there's a whole bunch of collecting events kind of written around here. We have to kind of go through and tease apart what they are. Uh, and then, so we have the scan notes with the PDFs, we have the brands put on, and then we have to digitize the data. So we basically set up Excel spreadsheets or workbench files where we can import the data to specify in our, pre our predefined columns that we already have kind of set up. So we um, had students go through and kind of translate out all the data that they could. Uh, then I go through and kind of check um, kind of what's going on. Um, there's uh, not all of us are perfect in the field, especially with foreign country names, so we have to go through. And you can do some editing of the original notes in, in the database version, but we have a remarks field, so if we change something that's in the field, like if you look at the note, you look in the database, like, oh, this one says this date, and that one says that date, well, maybe we actually figure that out, and so we can change it, so we can keep all those notes in the, in the, 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 uh, the database. Um, and then we do a reference. So uh, we go through, and there's not georeferencing, and we basically add in all the coordinates. And this actually is kind of a bonus because um, if, at least for a lot of the insect trips, like the lights are done by car or by road. And so if you have a whole trip's worth of notes in front of you, you can see, oh, you know, he collected here and then here and then he stayed here and then he went here and then here and then here. And so it really helps. You just had one label that just said, oh, I was 25 kilometers and such and such. It's much more harder to kind of figure out exactly where he was. But in this case, you can actually kind of follow along and make the geographic process easier. Slide. And then we, uh, we slap a uh, kind of generic information sheet on each PDF. Uh, and then in terms of the non-database side, I have a, a slide where we basically dump all these PDF files and the camera file to go along with all this collection online. So if you want to go look at them, you can go download them as full expedition files. So that's kind of the, the, the quick, not very complex back end of like how we actually process the files. In terms of how that integrates now with the database, and we have a specify six database, and then we go through and each collecting event so we, we, we have we've uploaded all the spreadsheet data, and then we go through and we attach all, we have broken out all the PDFs to the individual files, um, and attach them to the collection events and specify. Uh, I will, if you, uh, I, one uh, tip here that I, we've learned the hard way, so uh, if you are clicking and sharing these, I, I you might uh, explore uh, uploading them as JPEGs or TIFF images of the notes instead of uh, PDFs, because they're harder to uh, display online. Later. Um, so then we actually have to associate. So we've gotten all the data for the locality, right? Now we have to associate the specimens. Uh, how does this happen? This is what an actual label of Stanger looks like. Uh, and so just from that label alone, we can basically get this. You know, we get the PJS Venezuela, the date. We don't know what the lab, we don't, of course, we arbitrarily assign a number at the end. We don't actually know which one that is. We get close, but we're not sure. Um, so we query our database for that event from the data that we, we didn't know. And it turns out he had four collecting events on that particular day. Uh, we go back to the label. You see he had collection 24 with us there. The notes, original field number, you connected to 24. And that matches the rest, 40 kilometers south. So that's the right one. And the specimen get associated. Um, and just to give you an idea of how the power of this, so this is the top little line of the label data, what you have on the specimen in the museum. These two pages of the front and back of the field note pages go with those specimens. So now we have you know, from basically a few words to water quality information, the, the, what was around at the same time, all the things they collected, when we came back, and you know, the side of things work. It really unlocks this huge potential um, of more information if you want to actually find out more about these specimens and what happened to them. <coughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of riff here on a little bit one extra thing about uh, how this can kind of help other research aspects. Uh, I'm really interested in the ecological side uh, of my organisms. So when we have all the field notes and my original field collections, we often do this extra step. We still kind of plan around this, but um, we try to assign, and um, I know these are not uh, mutually exclusive categories, and I'm happy to talk about how we actually do this later, but we try to take from the notes, and if, uh, if we can, we assign them uh, one of the ecological categories in the database. So it allows us to do a little bit more um, data exploration, like instead of, um, you know, if you have a phytoton model like water and plants, and it might be written as Holoconias or Vermilion or something like that, it's very hard to actually search out all that data. Um, so instead, if, you have, if it's all coded as phytoton model, uh, then we can kind of pull that data out uh, pretty easily. And so um, we, we set up a customized specify six database um, for all the water beetle collections that, that I work with. And so we've got about 125,000 specimens. 
that's kind of the, the aggregator for all this data that I'm showing you. And um, just to kind of give you another perspective on this collection event, this is a so this is a specimen event based view from our database. This is all Venezuela. I work in Venezuela, I've made this by now. Uh, so uh, if you map all the specimens in the database, uh, this is a heat map of all the specimens. So if you were to go around, you hover and click and figure out how many specimens you have. It gives you a kind of rough idea of um, how good your coverage is in terms of specimens. But if you do this by collecting event, you could also collect, and we're going to be able to do this soon, um, you can also click through and actually give you an amount of effort. So you could go through and you know, show me all the density of, of, of the collecting events where we collected in streams. Or show me all the density of collecting events where the pH is less than 5. Right? So you can actually start to query the data based on the um, actual collecting event data as opposed to the specimens, which in my opinion is a little bit richer. This is another, this is a, um, uh, the same heat map now, it's, it's showing diversity of the genus, so like the, the, the hotter the square, the more gender are there. Um, you could think of it the same way, and, you know, the hotter the square, the more, you know, virulent really out there, something like that. Um, Uh, and again, just to kind of well, let me give you a real world example of how this actually works in terms of research application. Um, so uh, these are two species that basically, um, to the naked coleopterist eye, seemingly occupy a very similar habitat. They both live on granite outcrops in the Yana Shield. Um, and uh, they're both very common. Um, so uh, we thought they were kind of behaving very similarly, but if you actually um, go through the data that we've coded, um, you see that one species is useless. On the left, out of almost a thousand specimens, 87% is hydropetric and it's in the waterfalls. The other ones still have a lot of hydropetric dominant uh, ecology, but they're occupying a much broader niche space. The niche, the niche range is much broader. This allows us one um, to detect these kind of patterns, but also actually quantify, like actually quantify this in some kind of meaningful way, as opposed to just saying, yeah, this one kind of seems to be found more broadly than something else. And this is a we we did some uh, appetite networks with this. Uh, the one that has the the, uh, even though, again, I'm not going to explain this diagram except to say that uh, there are differences here. You can see that the colors are grouped on one side and not the other, uh, and they're basically showing there's some different population structure here, possibly related to the different kinds of niche width these species are occupying. Uh, and so in conclusion, uh, uh, I reiterate the, the importance of really uh, thinking about not just from a specimen-based approach, but collecting event-based approach trying to integrate not just the specimen data, but all the ancillary data that goes with it. And uh, I'll probably show you a little bit about why that might actually be beneficial both to you and to other researchers. So, thanks. Thanks, Andrew.